They are the two computer whiz kids who changed the world as we know it. Larry and Sergey always had this kind of irreverence as part of their attitude, which is what made them so creative. These two founders really think of themselves as noblemen. They think that what they're doing is good for the world. Larry Page and Sergey Brin were the kind of guys who kept Bill Gates up at night. Journalist Ken Oletta. I said, Mr. Gates, what is your nightmare? And I thought he would say Apple or Netscape or Oracle. And he said, I'll tell you what I worry about. I worry about some guy in a garage inventing a new technology Microsoft has never thought about. Well, in 98, two guys were in a garage and the hand lettered sign and it said Google Worldwide Headquarters. In an industry where innovation is just part of the job description, Larry Page and Sergey Brin have become virtual masters of the universe of information gathering. What we don't know, we Google. 629,000 results. Wow. And all this time, I thought Googling yourself meant the other thing. Not anymore. Silicon Valley is littered with startups that have stalled out. Why these two computer science geeks succeeded may have a lot to do with the nearly parallel lives they led before creating together one of the world's largest and most powerful companies. Brin and Page respectfully declined to participate in this program. Sergey Brin was born in the Soviet Union in 1973. His parents were mathematicians and Jewish, which limited their career opportunities. Mark Malseed is the co-author of The Google Story. So Sergey's father went to a conference in Warsaw, met a whole bunch of colleagues from the West, saw what life was like outside the Soviet Union, came back, sat the family down and said, we have to leave. His parents brought with them a sense of purpose they instilled in their son. It boiled down to a simple message. Don't come back with a B. Don't come back with the second place award. Make it first always. And Sergey internalized this, and it did form a core part of his personality. Like Bryn, Larry Page was born in 1973. His family lived in Michigan, and his father was the first person in his family to get a college degree. Both of his parents were in similar fields as Bryn's. They were the second generation computer science, which at that time was very unusual because computer science was really only developing as a field in the 60s. And here, both of their parents were advanced degrees. They see themselves as on a mission. And that mission, it really does spring from their biographies. In 2009, Paige shared that mission with the graduating class at the University of Michigan. You know what it's like to wake up in the middle of the night with a vivid dream? And you know how if you don't have a pencil and pad by the bed, it will be completely gone by the next morning. I had one of those dreams when I was 23. When I suddenly woke up, I was thinking, what if we could download the whole web and just keep the links? And I grabbed a pen and started writing. Soon after, I told my advisor, Terry Winograd, it would take a couple of weeks for me to download the web. He nodded knowingly fully aware it would take much longer, but wise enough not to tell me. Stanford professor and engineering consultant to Google, Terry Winograd. Larry just thinks of ways of doing things that you might not expect. Sergey was a lot like Larry. He also was someone who really wanted to think outside the box to say, if that sounds like it's impossible, let's try it. It was 1995 at Stanford University when the headstrong overachievers first met. One of their Stanford professors used to say, well, the difference between the two of them was that Sergey would just burst into my office without asking. Larry would knock and then burst in. In the 90s, searching the internet was rudimentary, hit or miss, often returning results that were useless. And the process was very slow. So you typed in your query, you did something else while you waited for it to get the results, then you went back and looked at the results, and most of them were completely irrelevant. Page and Bryn pushed for something better. 
Sergey's big interest was in taking all the pages on the World Wide Web and trying to make sense of it, trying to find patterns. They started to do a uh, record of backlinks, they called them. Page noticed that behind every web page, there were hundreds or even thousands of other pages that linked to it. It was a eureka moment that would change the so-called information age. Then they realized that that list of backlinks could be used for ranking. If you have more backlinks, it showed you were a better page. If a lot of other websites linked to a web page, that probably meant users thought it was good. So the genius was in recognizing that this kind of algorithm could give you the kind of results that mattered the most to searchers. Page and Brin had their secret formula. Now it needed a name. The guys were looking for a great name that was going to capture the grandiose vision that they had and hit upon this giant number, one with 100 zeros after it, commonly known as Google, G-O-O-G-O-L. They discovered it was owned. They said, you know what, let's put a friendlier spelling on it. On September 15th, 1997, they registered Google as a website. And Page and Brin dropped out of their PhD programs to focus on attracting funding for their young company. It wouldn't be easy. Investors like Ram Shuram were skeptical. There were five search engines at the time, and so I said maybe any one of them might be interested in the technology. The world didn't need a sixth search engine. Google just didn't fit into the conventional wisdom of what a website should do, which was to keep users from migrating to another page. Google did the unthinkable. It helped users explore the wider web. Larry Page and Sergey Brin had a different attitude. They said, we don't want a portal. We want to get the search results to them in a split second. So one sunny morning, Larry and Sergey were sitting on the porch of a Stanford professor a friend of theirs, and Andy Bechtelsheim, one of the founders of Sun Microsystems, pulls up in his sports car, walks up, gets about a 10-minute demo, says, this is fantastic, this is the next big, big thing, and writes a check on the spot for $100,000 made out to Google Inc. Stephen Levy is senior writer of Wired Magazine. This is the way things work in Silicon Valley. You know, it, it, it sounds astounding that someone would just write a $100,000 check and get you going. But you have to realize that there was a, a hidden pedigree to this. They were at Stanford. Their professors had done this before. This is a pretty good bet. We might lose our $100,000, but we could win big there. And at the time, we had no company at all. And in fact, we couldn't cash the check. <laughs> um, <laughs> This, by the way, with no legal documents, you know, none of that stuff. And even though they had the seed money, they still needed much more cash. No one was buying into Google. They went back to Ram Sharam. They found three other investors, and together we raised enough money to get them off the ground. Enough money was $1 million, including $250,000 from Jeff Bezos of Amazon.com. Page and Brin incorporated Google on September 4th, 1998, and they moved into one of those storied garages in Menlo Park. They attracted the attention of two well-known Silicon Valley venture capitalists, Michael Moritz of Sequoia Capital and John Doerr of Kleiner Perkins. Both wanted an exclusive deal. Brin and Page said no deal. They had the presence of mind at their tender age, in their mid-20s then, to say, we won't take money from only one venture capitalist. We want to assure that neither one of them has control, so we're going to split it. In June of 1999, Google issued its first press release announcing the investment, $25 million. Brin and Page now needed to hire first-rate engineers, people who would meet their exacting standards. Chris Saka is a former Googler. It was one of the most intense hiring processes of any company in the world. I had somewhere between 12 and 15 interviews over just a couple days. They created a headquarters they called the Googleplex, offering employee services like free food and childcare, and developed the informal company motto of don't be evil. But Google still wasn't making money. Larry would come in and I would say, well, how are you going to make money from this? And he would sort of give this little smile and say, well, we'll figure that out.
Google co-founders Larry Page and Sergey Brin had created a new search engine, but had yet to find a way to turn it into profit. They didn't like the idea of using advertising to cash in. At first they thought advertising was grubby, commercial, kind of unseemly. Their famously sparse homepage was originally designed by Sergey Brin. Unlike rivals Yahoo and AOL, Page and Brin refused to clutter their homepage with ads. We won't take any ads on the homepage, because we think to build user trust, we want to not feel like we're bogging them down with advertisements. Yet no ads at all meant no revenue. Page and Brin had to accept advertising as their only option. There were search engines in the early days, which when you went to a page, the first few things, which looked just like regular search results, happened to be things that the sponsors of those had paid the search engine to put there. And they said, that's not good for users. I don't want the things that somebody else wants me to see. I want the things that I want to see. Then they found a compromise they could live with. They invented a new way of targeting text ads triggered by search requests. Instead of distracting pop-ups or flashing ads, these small ads were placed above and next to search results. It's familiar now, but revolutionary back then. They called it Google AdWords. Businesses big and small could take control of their advertising dollars by purchasing ads keyed to certain words. David Thacker was a project manager on AdWords. Advertisers love the system because they only pay when someone actually clicks on their ad. For many advertisers, it's the most efficient form of marketing they ever have. For businesses, it was the holy grail, a direct connection to their best customers. With a massive new revenue source, Google exploded. By September of 2000, it had indexed a billion URLs and was available in 15 languages. Still, with all of Google's success, few people outside Silicon Valley knew who had created it. Sergey Brin went on to tell the truth and fooled the judges. Will or real, Sergey Brin, please stand up. But media moguls knew exactly who they were. Barry Diller was one of the first traditional media executives to visit Google guys. And Larry is sitting there with his PDA, his little handheld device, and he's looking down and doing his email. And he says, Larry, please, I'm talking to you. Can we just converse? And he says, I can do both. Barry Diller says, no, you can't do both. Choose. He says, I choose this. With tremendous growth came other challenging issues for the search giant Google. The venture capitalists behind the company, Michael Moritz and John Doerr, were pressuring its co-founders to hire a CEO. They were resistant, but they didn't want to say, you know, we can do it. But they thought they could do it. They went through 12, 13, 14 interviews. They didn't like any of the people they, they saw. They visited Steve Jobs just to meet him because he was a hero of theirs. And they said to John Doerr after the meeting, why can't he be our CEO? John Doerr introduced Page and Brin to Eric Schmidt, a businessman with an engineering background. You've just hired Eric Schmidt. He's come over to run Google. Yes, basically. So what, what's the idea behind that? Um, I mean, you guys couldn't run it yourself? Yeah, uh, parental supervision, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> you know. Eric is a grown-up. In, in the room. I mean, he's, he's in his mid-50s, not mid-30s. He's got a lot of experience. He's more of a diplomat than they are, and that's needed in dealing with the traditional media world, which they increasingly are bumping up against. By the end of 2001, Eric Schmidt was Google CEO. Page became president of products, and Bryn the president of technology. The two founders still shared an office. They have a mind melt. They anticipate each other's words. They back each other up. There's no sense of tension between them. That's one of the great strengths of that company. With Eric Schmidt in place, Google kept up its spectacular growth, while its rivals slowly faded away. The search engine linked to three billion web pages and forged a partnership with AOL, which brought them 34 million new customers. You had this incredibly profitable company. How are you going to get it to the next level? How are you going to provide the kind of capital growth that they needed? The solution? 
It was time for Google to go public. Being unconventional, they decided that they were going to hold an IPO unlike any that Wall Street had ever seen. They were going to set the price via an auction to determine and try to extract their greatest value from the stock. The stock price on August 19, 2004, closed at just over $100 a share, making the company worth more than $23 billion. The two founders became billionaires. Soon, the company expanded with Google Maps, Google News, and Google Earth. Their idealism and bold ideas had built their reputation, but the company was stumbling with their free email service. Gmail was a great product that was really poorly launched. When users saw ads pop up that were directly related to their personal emails, alarms went off. When people first saw these ads, they were shocked because they thought, how could these ads be so targeted? You know, I'm reading this, this email about uh, you know, my friend's vacation to Hawaii and I'm getting ads about Hawaii. Is somebody snooping into my email? The concern around Gmail launched a much deeper, fundamental argument about privacy and trust. Do you know how Google's using all the information it collects on you? All of the web searches that I've done for years and years, all of the emails that I've done, potentially information about health records, information about the books that I'm looking at, information about where I'm going because I'm typing it into Google Maps. In a sense, they're the big brother that we've been talking about all these years. The ultimate big brother was about to put their don't be evil philosophy to the test. In 2006, Google reached an agreement with China for access to their 400 million web users with one condition. They censor search results of banned topics. For Bryn, son of Russian immigrants, it was a troubling decision. At Google's Friday meeting, Sergei spoke with passion about growing up in the Soviet Union and how his parents literally escaped the Soviet Union and come to America and what that meant to him. And that dialogue happened, including everybody. They wanted to hear from all the employees there. Sergey swallowed hard, but they all said at Google, this is the biggest consumer market in the world. We have to be here. Google agreed to Chinese demands. I know there was a lot of controversy surrounding that, and we had to self-censor a fair amount. But we were actually able to censor less and less, and our local competitors there also censor less and less. So I feel like our entry made a big difference. Uh, but things uh, start going downhill. Google discovered a cyber attack on their systems. The more troubling thing to me is that we discovered the motivation uh, which we believed to be to gain access to Gmail accounts, in particular for Chinese human rights activists. Google pulled the plug and redirected users to an unfiltered site in Hong Kong that isn't subject to censorship. Is this real life? Yeah, this is real life. <laughs> Leave Britney Spears alone right now! YouTube began as a place for people to share home videos. It soon grew into one of the world's top search engines. By July 2006, users were uploading 65,000 videos a day and Google wanted in. They went out and acquired YouTube for $1.65 billion in Google stock. YouTube founders Chad Hurley and Steve Chen were thrilled. Today we have some exciting news for you. We've been acquired by Google. Yeah, thanks. In 2006, Google CEO Eric Schmidt acknowledged that to stay competitive, the company also had to enter the world of mobile phones. In fact, a year earlier, they had quietly bought another startup, Android, a small company with software for cell phones. There are so many more mobile phones than personal computers. As people do more and more searches on mobile phones, it should eventually balance out. Again, this would be many years. It didn't take years. Apple's phenomenal success with the iPhone in 2007 set a collision course between the two companies. Hey guys, very excited to be here today. Months later, Brin and Page announced their Android operating system would run on a variety of mobile phones. Their longtime idol, Steve Jobs, slammed Google for entering the phone business and accused them of trying to kill the iPhone. At the Google Developer Conference in May of 2010, 
Google's vice president of engineering tore into Apple. If Google did not act, we faced a draconian future. A future where one man, one company, one device, one carrier would be our only choice. That's a future we don't want. And Google is battling with another giant in the tech world. They bump up against Microsoft in so many ways. They have a browser, Chrome. Microsoft has Internet Explorer. Google also acquired companies that dealt with online versions of word processing software and spreadsheets, things that directly go after Microsoft's jugular with their Office product. Microsoft fired back with its own search engine, Bing, which debuted in spring of 2009. Can I ask what you make of Bing? Do you like it? Um, <laughs> I think... Uh... You a Bing user? Uh, oh yeah, no, no, I, 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 use, I use all search engines out there. Uh, I think that what Bing has reminded us uh, uh, is that the search is a very competitive market. Bing ironically offered Google protection by letting them dodge accusations of being a monopoly. Bill Gates said this is the company that is closest to us as a competitor. They are just as hungry and as ruthless, he didn't use that word, but I am, as we are. There is a danger, they make a lot of enemies. It's a blind spot because these two founders really think of themselves as noblemen. They think that what they're doing is good for the world. They've always enjoyed feeling like the underdog, feeling like the evil empire was Microsoft. And now they've discovered that some people think they're the evil empire. Their own slogan, do no evil, was suddenly being used against them. Google's quest on the road to organize the world's information took a new turn. Call it a detour with an ambitious feature they called Street View, an attempt to photograph every neighborhood on the planet. It would eventually include ordinary images from Main Street to extraordinary views of Antarctica. But the effort also took private user information from unsecured Wi-Fi locations. Many people felt their privacy had been compromised. Google acknowledged the mistake and agreed to destroy data. The company known for search was struggling to diversify and was facing an aggressive new challenger, Mark Zuckerberg. Facebook's one billion users spend more time on the social network, posting valuable information that is invisible to Google's search engine. Information that all advertisers chase. So far, Google's efforts at social networking have failed. But its founders are keenly aware that as users' habits on the web change, Google will have to make a lot more friends. In January 2011, in a startling Silicon Valley shakeup, Eric Schmidt announced that Google was simplifying its management structure and that Larry Page was ready to lead and would take over from him as CEO. Co-founder Sergey Brin will focus on new products. Schmidt tweeted, day-to-day -day adult supervision no longer needed. In 14 years, Google grew from startup to technology giant hitting $50 billion in revenue in 2012. In the space of a year, Larry Page and Sergey Brin both got married. Page married Stanford Bioinformatics PhD Lucinda Southworth in December 2007 on Richard Branson's island. Branson was also his best man. Brin married biotech specialist Ann Wojcicki in the Bahamas with his partner Larry Page standing up for him. They both have two children. Google.org, its philanthropic arm, has contributed over $100 million to various organizations from clean energy to global health. Larry Page and Sergey Brin have changed the way we get information. It's been a, a, a great experience for me to see them grow over the last uh, 12 years that I've known them. Uh, I, I feel extremely proud of what they've accomplished. Larry and Sergey always had this kind of irreverence as part of their attitude, which is what made them so creative. It's great. I think Google attracts people who care, who care about users, who care about their fellow human, who care about the planet, and just can't sit still. They built a company that absolutely changed the world.